Gearheads. Welcome back to the Geo Gearheads, episode 415. I'm Daryl W4, back as usual with Chris of the Northwest. Well, hello, Daryl. Can you believe we've done 414 other episodes? I can, especially because there's actually a few more of those that were like bonus shows and patron shows. Well, I think this is going to be the best 415th episode we've done yet. I, I guarantee it. Yeah. Especially because we were bringing in a guest again. Uh, most of our listeners are going to be familiar with uh, GSM Times 2. Uh, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. So tonight we are going to be talking about cash maintenance, which believe it or not, we've not done a show just on cash maintenance. We did a couple seasonal cash maintenance shows. How can that be? I, I know. I can't believe that we've never talked about cash maintenance as a topic. Well, we've corrected this glaring oversight now. So we've talked about cash maintenance. We're done. Yeah, that's the show. Okay. So no. thanks, thanks GSM times two for uh, making the suggestion. We've now covered the show and we're done. <laughs> well, uh oh, I think we and, lost. Uh, and he was serious about <laughs> Daryl. You got to quit joking with our guests because they don't know when you're serious or not. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. We'll get him back shortly. I'm but, sure we uh, will. You know, now I know he's going to tell us a little bit about himself and how many hides he has. But, you know, to me, it's not a reasonable amount of hides. It is to him. But he currently has 1,800 plus hides out there. But only 119 are active. So he's, he's uh, 819 did. are active. Yes, yes. So he's. Oh, you're okay. So yeah. he only has 800 plus. Right. Active. But he's oh, hidden. Seems so much better already. Many, many more of that. Yeah. But yeah, I, I can't even keep up with like 10 hides. I have three, I think, active. And, uh, you know. No, I, I might have more than that now. I might have four. But, um, but in the meantime... I, I have 800. John John says, uh, nice hat, Chris. Well, thank you. That, just that's the Christmas spirit. So yeah. you are in the Christmas spirit. I'm Christmas of the Northwest. Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, we get, it starts early, doesn't it? Oh, and it never stops. Is the problem. It, it started before... The uh, record light went on, guys. <laughs> okay. What are you trying to say, Daryl? Uh, I'm saying that we're always this bad. Yeah, we are. Well, you know, we have fun. I, yeah, I seem to like our fun. I attribute a lot of that to the fact that this is after work for both of us. And for me, it's like my bedtime. Oh, see, <laughs> for me, I just had dinner and I'm ready to go. You know, you're, you're was, fully yeah. energized for bad puns. Exactly. I was talking to somebody this week, you know, and they go, well, one of the things we like is, you know, it's that you and Daryl are, are actually like yourselves. You know, we're not putting on a face. This is how we really are. I said, yeah, this is how I am. I just don't talk this much, you know, normally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a lot uh, quieter normally in the uh, house than it is during this one hour a week. And Daryl, I would have to say you're lucky that you're in bed by midnight because he actually gets a lot uh, punnier <laughs> at, um, at, at nine o'clock uh, Pacific time. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> the I, I have actually later. caught the episode a few times as I'm trying to wrap up, uh, especially the randomized shows. Right. Take me a lot longer to wrap up. Yeah. And I well, did try to get the show out. The show this week, so you'll get to bed early. But next week. I'm sorry. Next, yeah, next week we've got a randomized show again, and we've got a whole bunch of material for that show. Yeah. But that doesn't mean we don't want more feedback. We've gotten a little bit on the uh, GPS versus uh, uh, smartphone debate, uh, some tips for uh, uh, users to use both. So make sure to send those in to geogearheads at cashmaniacs.com. If you can get them to us by uh, Tuesday, that would be awesome, but definitely by Wednesday because we go live on Thursday. So again, that's geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com with any of your feedback for that uh, randomized show next week. Love. Our last one before Christmas. Well, GSM times two. Yes, sir. Would you like to introduce yourselves a bit? I mean, we are we already basked in the glory of how many hides you have. Uh and I'm just going to take that vicariously through you because there's no way I can maintain 800 <laughs> active caches. But um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, GSM times two. I have a 
a YouTube channel, Scott No High Videos. Um, been geocaching since November 2004. Uh, have 23,000 plus finds, uh, which means that I've had a chance to see a lot of really good geocaches and well-maintained geocaches, and also the opposite side. Um, I have hidden, amazingly, over 1,800 geocaches. Uh, as of today, 18, 819 of them are not only active, but they're out there. I have, at this point, no geocaches that are temporarily disabled. So uh, I think I do a pretty good job of uh, doing maintenance, and uh, and I'm glad that you brought me in on the show uh, to, to share some of my ideas. Um, That's fantastic. Now, we do want to learn your secrets. How can you keep 800 ac caches active at a time? But before we get into that, um, you, I'm, let me tell you, uh, GSM times two, you are one of the more prepared guests we've ever had. We've got multiple pages of notes. So thank you very much. And, uh, you know, just having these all here in nice uh, outline form with Roman numerals and such, it, it makes me want to go through them. My, my OCD says I have to jump into these quickly because we may not be able to get through them all. Well, you he know, knew he had to do the Roman numerals because he's on the Geo Gear hits. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it was interesting because as I prepared, I realized, you know, my experience hiding this many and maintaining this many really isn't going to be very useful um, for the people who, you know, normal people set, you know, 50 or somewhere under 100. Normal. So what I kind of did is, uh, what's that? 10. 10. Normal yeah. people are 10. So I went over to the Facebook group, uh, you might be a geocacher if, and the, the one that has five dots on it, because it has 14,000 members. And I put out there, hey, would you guys uh, share some ideas with me on how you maintain your geocaches? Um, and then I also am inviting people, and we got uh, active uh, chat already asking questions, and I would like them to share their ideas on how they maintain geocaches. Um, so, you know, that that should be good. I think that's going to be really good and make it helpful for everybody. Um, I have in the show notes put the ridiculous things that I do <laughs> to maintain 800 geocaches, and if we get a chance, we'll we'll go through those very, very briefly. But uh, let's get into uh, what what's more normal. I think uh, for me, maintenance starts in three. It, it involves three different areas. It involves uh, the initial hide, creating a good initial hide. Uh, then you have to monitor the logs, and then you actually have to have a strategy for performing maintenance. Um, so, and again, I'm looking for people in the live chat to, uh, to share their ideas. Um, when I went to the Facebook group, the number one thing people said is have it close to home, close to work, or along routes that I normally take. And that way I can check on them frequently. Uh, even if I don't get a needs maintenance uh, log or a DNF log, they can check on them. And that's a, that's a great way. And I thought that was a terrific, uh, a terrific suggestion, one that I wish I had uh, adhered to. I have not. Um, so I think that's great. What about you, Daryl? I was going to say, uh, I want to get into the initial hide stuff because that is uh, such a key element to having a cache that can be maintained is uh, really putting that effort in beforehand, understanding what works and what doesn't. And we're going to talk about a bunch of those uh, things that you hand that you work with and probably have picked up because some of these don't look like they're necessarily uh, tips that you need in your area, but not all of these are going to work for your area. Right. Some of the things will work in your area. So you have to kind of pay attention before you make that initial hide as to what some of the other hides are that are working and are not working in your area. Absolutely. That suggestion that came out of the Facebook group is go look, go find old geocaches and see what's working and what's not working in your area. I thought that was a great suggestion. Explain um, what you mean by an old geocache. You know, one that's five years, five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old. Um, you know, one that has a, has a chance to have been exposed to the elements in your area. And uh, and is it surviving? Is it not surviving? 
you know, and you can take a look at those uh, maintenance logs for an idea of to how mm-hmm. many times people have uh, uh, had to do maintenance on it. But it was it's not going to tell you how many times other people have done the maintenance. So that kind of stuff you'd have to dig into it a little bit. You might have to dig into it. And uh, we got asked a question uh, before the show of how much maintenance should us as finders uh, do on other people's caches. Um, Chris, what do you think? Um, you know, as a hider with only a few caches hidden, I appreciate when people do maintenance for me. I mean, I, now what I would do out in the field is change a log. Mm-hmm. Really, I, you know, I, I don't feel more comfortable than that doing maintenance out in the field unless I know the owner and I can, you know, uh, contact them quickly. Um, you know, I, if you come up to it and the container is, you know, spread out, uh, the contents of the container are spread out before you on the ground, put it all back together, dry it out as much as you can. Now, when that happens, if you haven't found the cache before, you have no idea where it should be. Right. So right. I would pick a reasonable location. This looks like a good location to me. Hide it, take some pictures and contact the uh, cash owner and say, this is, hey, here's the condition I found the cash in. Here's what I did. Here's where I put it. Um, you know, if that's not acceptable to you, I'll go get it and, you know, take it off of the play field if that's what you prefer. Excellent. You know, let's let's go back though and uh, get back into our hiding stage. What what happens when you hide them? Um, to me, they they have to be bungle resistant, weather resistant, animal resistant. At least in my area, they have to be animal resistant. So, for me, and this is a suggestion that came from Facebook, where somebody said. Make sure that there's no direct line of sight from the pathway to the geocache. So if it's on a sidewalk, get it back. So somebody walking down the sidewalk isn't going to be able to see it uh, full line in sight, but a geocacher will. Um, This is something that's happened to me a number of times where somebody has hidden a very clever, or maybe not clever, it's just a veggie hide in a neighborhood, and it's going to take 10 to 15 minutes to find. Uh, that's going to draw attention. So, you know, in matching the geocache with the location, try and your your difficult hides, put them in an isolated area where you're not going to draw attention from the neighborhood. Because after 15 minutes, uh, a couple things are going to happen. You're going to have the neighbors calling the police and showing up, or you're going to have the neighbors watching what you're doing. And after you've leave, they'll go do it. And if they find the container, there's a very good chance that container is going to wind up missing. Um, and then one other person said, don't put it where geocachers are going to, where muggles are going to congregate. Like if you're going to put it on top of a hill, on top of a mountain, uh, don't put it right on top because everybody's going to go and hang out there. Put it off to the side a little bit lower where people aren't going to congregate. All very good tips. Yeah. Yeah, Um, I I thought so. I always like the, uh, uh, hides on the, uh, uh, neighborhood watch signs. I think that's kind of hysterical. <laughs> don't do that. That's a perfect example of where not to put them. But the neighborhood is watching. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Great point, Daryl. Though, though I have to admit, most of those that I've done are the quick, easy mm-hmm. uh, nanos in the uh, signposts. So they, right. they are pretty quick. They could get up there, get a walk. It, you know, and, and a nice thing for finders to do is walk away and sign your log. Don't just stand there. Don't grab it, stand there next to the post and then put it right back up. Walk away a little bit at least, uh, maybe go back into the car, depending on what what it is you need to do. But that that is something finders can do to help us uh, cash owners. You want to take a quick break and we have uh, a couple of comments in here. Yes. Uh, first one from uh, uh, Jim Stark. I have 84 hides, 71 active. When any log indicates a possible issue, I add the cache to a cache repair bookmark list and run the run a uh, the, excuse me and include a description of the issue, and then use that list to plan a maintenance run. Nice, super. Well, and one of the nice things about doing it that way is you can export that as a GPX file or cache the list or whatever. 
So it's really easy to bring up and do your maintenance uh, uh, right in the GPS or, you know, set yep. your routes. I would imagine if you really wanted to and it was over a long enough distance, you could take that into uh, Cache Torno and create a nice, easy route to get to all of them. There you go. Absolutely. When we talk about maintenance runs, uh, we'll talk about that. But that's a suggestion that I had not heard. That's a great suggestion. Very much. And then we also have uh, John Gardner again. I think one of the best uh, things a finder can do is report what is wrong in a post nicely, of course. So, yeah, sometimes I'll do those as a uh, needs maintenance log if there is actually something wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, other times I'll actually comment to the uh, owner through the um, um, message uh, yeah, center. Yeah, because that perfect. way, if there's something that's sensitive, I don't want to put it in the uh, uh, log. And a lot of the times it's like, hey, I did find something that's wrong. Here's where it is specifically. Here's the photos like Chris was talking about. Yeah, you know, is this the right spot? You know, that way there's no spoilers in the logs. And the nice thing about that is it's creating a separate uh, entry, a separate email from the log because, it, I mean, it would be nice, you know, people who have 30, they probably read every single log. Mm -hmm. I'll admit people over 100, we probably aren't reading every single log. So to either send us a message or I'm really begging people, send me a needs maintenance because as we'll find out later, I flag those. Yeah. Needs maintenance is uh, at least easy to uh, tag in the uh, email filter. Right. So, and you know. sends out a separate email with a separate subject line, right. which can then have a rule that goes into a separate uh, folder and they're easy to spot. <laughs> yeah, which is why I don't like doing notes for uh, needs maintenance right. or including it in the log. Now, if it's just a minor thing, sometimes I'll include it in the log because it doesn't need maintenance. Yeah. Right. And I don't want to. And this is the, the problem with the needs maintenance. It does actually put a flag on the cache. And depending on the reviewer, a lot of them are enforcing the what is it? A two week rule that they have to maintain the cache within two weeks or at least post that they will. Uh, maintain it within two weeks or they disable and then eventually archive that cache. So you're telling me, Scott, you prefer as the author of the do not log that cache article that uh -huh. people log a needs maintenance cache on your caches. That's exactly. Don't okay. just give me a do not, do not, do not give me just a DNF. Give me a DNF and a needs maintenance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's get back into your, uh, Encyclopedia into, into of knowledge weather here. resistant. You know yeah. what? Weather resistant. I'm just going to hand it to you guys. You know, yeah. Uh, keep you it don't all, have any weather out there. That's it for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, th it's funny. Um, I think it's a little farther down. I'm I'm going to point out one of the articles or one of the uh, containers you like are Altoid tins. Those are terrible here in the Northwest. Oh, they I really can imagine. Those are you know, any kind of metal container like that is generally a bad idea but it works in some uh, climates yes and even like out here which is the same as yours if you actually can uh, seal them and altoid tins generally don't because of the way that the uh, hinges close right you know you can paint it you can spray paint it and that will help to seal it it does but because of the way that hinge closes yeah. it will it, it will scratch the paint off but, yeah there's not yeah. enough room yeah yeah but I have seen some of them where they have uh, a different closure mechanism mm -hmm. and those will work because there's a little bit more play in there. They're not watertight, but they work if you put them like under a lamp skirt. Exactly. Right. So, so I generally there, avoid the metal in all because it's, it's risky and especially like those Altoid tins yeah. turn into razor blades. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, uh, weather resistant, don't use uh, Tupperware. You know, they, especially in the cold environments, they will become hard, brittle, and you go to open the lid and you just end up breaking the lid. So Now, that I want to put a caveat on that, that we have a lot of luck with certain types of uh, food containers like that. The lock and locks are notoriously uh, geocache containers, and that's because they actually work. However, out here, mm -hmm. if they go through one good winter, you're going to have to replace that uh, cache. Right. So 
expect to do that, but they make great containers, especially for those uh, park systems that require that it be a translucent container. Well, and that's another one, you know, paint and tape is great to weatherproof it, but then you can't see into it. Right. And a lot of places do require that you have that window, but they'll sometimes say it has to be uh, translucent on like two sides. They have to have a window on two sides. Yeah. So you can paint all but like the two sides and make sure those two sides are covered so that they don't get exposed to the light. Yeah. And that's one of the big things with the paint and the tape is blocking that light, which makes the uh, uh, plastic brittle. Yeah, the UV light. Uh, and Scott, if you don't mind, the next one you says sun. So avoid the sun, put it in the shade. Which put it in the shade. Here in the Northwest for the next six months, we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> no, you you have everything else to worry about, but no, you don't we, have to worry about really shade. We worry about waterproofing. Yes. Are not waterproof. Uh, well, and out here, we're going to start getting some snow. Yep. Yeah, there you which, go. Guess what happens when the snow melts? Um, it gets warmer. Well, it gets warmer <laughs> and, and wetter. That, that uh, uh, snow that's gotten packed around and hasn't uh, uh, gotten wet yet suddenly becomes uh, wet, uh, e like covering your cache. So any little uh, uh, holes... Any little water, especially with the freezing that happens, any cracks, yeah. it causes problems. You know, we've seen caches where the uh, uh, seals go bad, and you get a little water in there, and all of a sudden it's cracked. You have seals in Michigan? We do. <laughs> okay. Mostly at the zoos. Okay. Perfect. But when not... they get out, they wreak havoc on your cache. That get, that gets into the animal resistant part. It does get in the animal resistant part. That's and the animal I'm resistant good. part is be very careful about using anything that had food in it mm -hmm. uh, because you can wash it through the dishwasher, but some animals um, will continue to smell the peanut butter. They'll continue. I had a, 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 dr a hydrating drink that was lemon flavored, and every one of those that I set uh, got bear bites in it. So I don't know why the bear love it, but they did. Um, you know, this is one of those arguments that uh, I've had with one of our more uh, prolific hiders in the area. And I let him win it every time because he knows a heck of a lot more than I do. I think he has like twelve or 1,400 active caches at any given time. Oh, my God. But part of why his works so well, he has so many of the caches that he needs the quantity and he does turn them over I think his longest running uh, cash series are like three years old. Mm -hmm. So they turn over fairly quickly, yep. but he has a whole process that he's perfected and he's happy to share it with people of how you take like the Gatorade bottles. Uh, there's a few other drink uh, bottles and then some of the candy containers. Mm -hmm. And he goes through this whole washing process and then he paints them. Mm. So he has this whole process. It's a whole assembly line. And he has almost no trouble with his caches. Hmm. Nice. So nice. you'll it, have to share that with us. Yeah, somehow. I'll have to get the whole recipe. Yeah. But for him, it does work. And he has, you know, he's one of the guys that does the cache and cache thing. So the log is in a uh, like uh, right. one of the specimen tube things, or a bison tube, or some uh, another container within. Yeah. It. Well, he he does everything on the cheap. Okay. <laughs> so okay. it's. Yeah, you know, it's all reused containers uh, mm -hmm. or containers that he gets for free. Right. So, you know, so, he has the log in another container in the container. And one of the things that he does acknowledge is because he's using these used drink containers, they don't weather seal as well. And we have a lot of trouble with condensation out here mm -hmm. because of the humidity and cold and hot. So even if it does seal well, those containers tend to collect water. Yep. So that's his fix for doing that. Very good. Um, this next little comment about magnets, and, and, and I don't like Altoid tins either. So I'm just going to, if somebody wants to read them in the show notes, but I'm going to pass on something else. Um, if you're going, and this is something finders can do. If, when you hide it, 
put the lid uh, above the bottom and it doesn't have to be totally it doesn't have to be you know completely up and down it can be tilted just as long as when water comes on it it'll go down this way instead of that way getting into the threads and then going into the container and so for finders when you get a container make sure the top goes up not mm -hmm. the bottom um because it's almost a guarantee as you know in michigan especially i've done some geocaching in michigan Every time I see it like that, I just anticipate, and 90% of the time I'm correct. I'm going to get a wet log. Yep. Yeah, and, and you're holding up a, a pill bottle from I'm, Yeah, I'm like holding pharmacy. up a pill bottle from a pharmacy. Oh. But, and but anything. The, uh, yeah, definitely. I, uh, I had somebody who put a lock and lock. It was in good shape, lock and lock, upside down. When I went to just check on it randomly, it was full of water. Right. Well, and the problem with the like lock and locks or any of these containers... Uh, but when you put them down in like the uh, crook of a tree or something, right. that's where the water is going to pool. So now you've got that seal that's just soaked. Yep. But with the uh, pharmacy pill bottles, uh, that same hider was telling us, you have to get the ones with the uh, rubber seal on the inside of the lid. If they don't have that, they are not going to be watertight at all. All right. Good to know. Uh, yeah, so there's another uh, quick tip on those. Well, let, let me go back to one of our first things of good cash planning is the initial hide. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we're talking about magnets. If you glue a magnet into the um, lid of the container so it only can be put back one way, it will always stay dry for you. As long as it's hanging. Right, hanging underneath. Hanging right. underneath, it'll stay dry a lot better than... A lot of people just put the container, put the magnet in the bottom, and then they they hang it upside down, and it's going to get if there any water gets onto that, it's going to go in. Um, and then, as far as magnetism, I guess we'll talk about the magnetism. Um, usually, I don't even bother doing anything. I just stick the magnet on the container and let it be. But if you're concerned that somebody's going to take the magnet, put it on, and then put a seal of uh adhesive outside so it's not between the between the magnet and the container because that you're going to lose your magnetism that way mm -hmm. well, or reduce or reduce it and it's good to put the magnet inside the container because yeah. if you go through hot and cold cycles whatever <laughs> glue you have no matter how good it is uh will fail and they'll pull the container down and the magnet will stay up there and they may not see it and go i don't know how to put this back yep. it doesn't you know it doesn't stick. I, how did it get up there in the first place? So Absolutely. Well, and if you expose the glue to the elements, it's that much more yeah. likely it's going to fail. Absolutely. Uh, getting back to the uh, resistant, uh, well, animals resistant caches, what Coaster wants to know about slug resistant caches. That's simple. Fill your container with salt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of <laughs> laughing because I have no idea what to do about it, oh. aside from making sure that you have really good seals good, on that container. Seal. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But even then, uh, you know, I can't count how many containers I've picked up that are covered in uh, uh, bugs. And, uh, and the, the, the pincher matter, bugs. The pincher bugs. bugs are the worst. Oh yeah, earwigs. Oh, I hate yeah, the earwigs. earwigs. They they just creep me out ever since Rathath Khan. Yeah, they're they're terrible. They are. But um, um, the only thing I can tell you is they love they love paper. So putting. Putting a cache in a cache is a good is a good way to slow down them. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. and uh, oh shoot, I was just gonna say the uh, uh, plastic ammo cans. I've seen so <laughs> many of those plastic ammo cans with uh, ants nests in them with uh, lots of baby oh. ants. Oh, so I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, those uh, because they have some holes and little nooks and crannies in the uh, uh, latch to sound that up. That's where a lot of those uh, uh, nests. So I've started being very cautious whenever I see one of those because some of those ants are not very nice to us cashers. Yeah, and yeah. and remember, we're invading their home. Yes, oh, absolutely. Outside, you're invading somebody else's space. Yep, and so definitely watch out. You know, when you set it, look for the pack rat nests and try not to do it around the pack rat nest. Uh, Look for, you know, you're going underneath the tree. Make sure that's not some animal's burrows under there that you're hiding it in and, and so forth. 
Uh, Jim some. Stark uh, uh, says, from his observation, uh, coffee containers don't seem to be attacked by animals. Maybe the animals know something that we don't. Uh, I've actually seen quite a few of the uh, uh, the softer, like Folgers style cans. Yes, that have been uh, chewed up as uh, animals try to get into them. Mm. But that's interesting because uh, coffee does tend to mask other odors and make it more difficult for animals to find. Some maybe that's part of it. I bet they're just going there in the mornings, though. <laughs> Exactly. That's part of waking up is, you know, zero Folgers, in, Folgers in your cup. Yep. Nice. Not not sponsored, by the way. <laughs> All right. So why don't we move on to uh, monitoring the emails? Uh, why don't we look on monitoring the emails? Okay. So people who have, you know, 30 to 90 or fewer geocaches, don't just read the DNFs. Go ahead and read all of the emails that come in so that if people are making comments and giving you suggestions and letting you know that there's issues, that you're going to see them. Um, for me, again, if if you're telling me about a maintenance issue, I really would appreciate if you'd uh, either send me a message or, excuse me, yeah. she's going to continue to bother me if I don't pick her up. Okay. Um, send me a message or... Put the needs maintenance. You know, needs maintenance is the log is full. The official ones are the log is full. Uh, the caches may may be missing, um, and there's and the cache container may be broken. Add those on there. Um, it, it, it's for me. It's very helpful. It may not be important for the people who have thirty caches and they can read all their email, but but do just read all of your email. Um, Somebody suggested a bookmark list. Make some kind of a list. It could be a document. It could be a spreadsheet. It could be a database. And then I, we're going to get to the pro tip because I've just started doing this. Import it into your favorite uh, geocaching app so you have it with you all the time. Today I was surprise, surprise preparing for this show, uh, going doing a maintenance run. And uh, by gosh, I found myself two and a half miles from a cache that had a, a DNF as the last log. And so I was able to go check it out. And on the way home, I had another cache that had one DNF on it. And I was able to check it out on the way home because I had it in my phone and and ready to go. So that's my pro tip. Uh, keep, keep it in your phone and you'll have it available at all times. Um, Let's see. What am I saying here? I'm saying, uh, well, go ahead, Daryl. Fill me in. <laughs> well, you do these maintenance runs. Uh, yeah. What do you take with you? I mean, do you? How many log books? How many containers do you have in your car for an emergency like this? I have I have a, 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 a three level toolbox in my car um, that has things in it all the time. Whether I'm doing a maintenance run or whether I'm just going geocaching. Um, I try and help. I try and help people out by not replacing the log necessarily, but adding a new log if the mm -hmm. log is full. If the container is, you know, if if it's a pill bottle that's cracked and I have a pill bottle, I'll swap them out one for one um, for active geocachers. And I'm you know, I, at towards the end here. I might uh, talk about refreshing the game field, but uh, and and try and get on another show. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so that's what I, I always have things with me to do maintenance. And then, you know, if I'm going on a maintenance run, I'll, I will add some more things. Um, if I'm going to be replacing a lock and lock box, I'll make sure I take a lock and lock box with me. And where do you get these supplies to have with you? Um, do you use write in the rain paper? Do you use normal paper? What do you I, use, I use normal paper. Um, when I go to uh, mega events, I'll pick up uh, different types of containers that I can't otherwise get. Um, I do use a lot of pill bottles because I have, between me, my wife, and my dog, um, I have a constant supply of pill bottles, um, <laughs> and they're free, and they work. If properly hidden and protected, they work fairly well for me in my environment. All my pill bottles require a copay. Uh, yeah, well, it's copay is, okay. you, but you still get the pills. <laughs> um, I, uh, I wanted to uh, bring up a, a, a quick one. 
a quick recommendation. If you're trying to figure out which ones of your uh, caches need to have a, uh, a maintenance run done, you can essentially create that automated uh, bookmark list. If you look uh, for the uh, needs maintenance icon in the pocket queries, you can build that list. So just set it up for anything that you own that needs maintenance and you have your list that's delivered to you on a, a daily basis if you so wish. Yes, absolutely. Nice, um, and it makes it easy to download from any of the apps. Absolutely, right. yeah. It, it's right there. It's easy. It's and, and the nice thing is you get that uh, email notification, and it just pops up with anything that you might have missed a log that came in. Mm-hmm. So absolutely. handy, uh, handy tool to do. It is absolutely a handy tool to do. Um, it's one of the things that I do because I have a ridiculous number of caches is every day I have a, uh, a pocket query that tells me what caches ha- have been reported DNFs and what caches have been reported needs maintenance. Not that I run those every single day, but, but they're up to date every single day. So- um, Yes. Scott, you're talking about these maintenance runs. How often do you do them? I mean, you're you're looking at 800 plus caches. This could be an everyday occurrence. It could be an everyday occurrence. Um, I I try and do maintenance runs, not necessarily. I try and do them as I as I'm out there. You know, if I get near a geocache that I've set, I'm just going to check it, um, and then probably once a month or maybe once every six weeks, depending on how many things come in, um, I'll go ahead and, you know, create, create a geocaching adventure of my caches and I'll, and Bella and I will go out and, uh, and go check out, check out all those caches. Um, for me, two DNFs, um, two DNFs by experienced geocachers on a cache that should be found easily is going to create, it's going to have me uh, make it a, I'm going to disable it and then get it off the list until I get a chance to check it. Um, and, you know, so people aren't going to, people don't, I don't want to see, and nobody wants to see five DNFs in a row with mm-hmm. no action by the, by the cash owner. So that's, that's what I do. Um, yeah. And, and it seems to work. You know, seems to work. At least keeps them off, gets gets them off the list, so people aren't aren't getting them in their PQs. Nice. Yeah. Going back a little bit to figuring out where the uh, problems might lie, Ian says that uh, he doesn't always read the emails, but he often does a uh, peek at the caches in a rotation to make sure that there's no issues. Very good. That that's a very diligent uh, hider. Absolutely. So I, I applaud that, but it does take a lot of effort, especially if you have, you know, 50, 60, mm-hmm. 800 and change caches. You know, even if you have 30 caches that are a long distance away and spread apart, uh, it can be difficult. So I think that's why that that suggestion from uh, that do them near your house, do them near your work, do them on routes that you normally will take uh, is a great suggestion. Yeah. And if you can do maintenance runs on a regular basis, you know, like typically we talk about uh, the spring and fall maintenance runs. Right. Do those to make sure that the uh, cache is in good order, that people aren't not finding it and just not posting the logs. Because not everyone is going to post a log. Boy, and and, as we talked about uh, on a previous visit to the show, (laughs) we we certainly did. We talked about, you know, encouraging everyone who does a legitimate search for a geocache, write something, you know, write it, write it as a found, write it as a DNF, write it as a log, but write something so that the cache owner, as Chris said during that show, cache owner knows that there's activity on that geocache. And uh, don't be afraid of the DNFs, you know. It's it's part of the game. Uh, Ian also says, uh, uh, always watch for those maintenance icons. You can do it without the pocket query just by looking through your hides and finding the icon in the list. Yep. Very true. And you don't necessarily need the pocket query. You no, can no. do it through tools like GSAC and Cashly will let you do the uh, 
searches easily. You know, you can do filters and uh, do a lot of that kind of stuff as well. But there's a lot of uh, automated tools if you want to go into uh, doing that that will help you build those lists. One of the easiest ones is to to start to hide a cache. Just put in there, hide a cache, and it will pop up like the second screen. Are you sure you want to do this? Because here's here's what's out there for you, and there's a list of every DNF and every uh, mm-hmm. uh, these maintenance log. Yeah, I want to th- say it was a uh, uh, Project GC had a maintenance um, filter mm-hmm. that you could run a, re- a report. They would actually go and scour the logs up until your last uh, maintenance run. Ooh, wow! And look for things like wet log and that kind of stuff in the. Uh, uh, logs themselves, but I might just be thinking of something that uh, uh, Magnus had talked about with us. Mm-hmm. So it, I could be wrong on that. Oh, this is an interesting one, totally off the uh, current subject, but uh, right. Starcasher said that he bought a box of the Write in the Rain letter paper and uses uh-huh. his laser printer and forms downloaded from the internet to create double sided log sheets and a, a paper uh, cutter for most of his logs. Mm hmm. Now, wow, I've, I've done the same thing, mm-hmm. uh, and I've been doing it for years and years of creating my own logs because, well, I do design stuff. But the thing that I'm going to uh, uh, make a pro tip here, use a color laser printer rather than a black and white or inkjet because the way that the uh, laser printer, the black and white laser printer works is typically a graphite-based toner. Oh, that tends to flake off the paper easier. Oh, inkjets with the yeah, and you have to get the inkjet right in the rain paper tend to work okay, but depending on the type of inkjet, uh, I think it was the HPs tend to run, but the Epsons were fine, kind of thing. You know, it's like there was a whole lot, and even with the ones that do work right, they bleed a little bit more than they do on right. the right type of paper. So I, I just don't like the inkjets, and I have seen even on the right in the rain. When the uh, paper gets wet enough, it still is going to bleed. But the color laser is actually a plastic. So that melts right into the paper, the right in the rain paper, and doesn't tend to come off. Well, here, let me unplug my speaker here and have my wife listen to this because Christmas is just around the corner, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. Your cash, your your high uh, number hiders, a color laser printer for Christmas. And there we go. (laughs) Links will not be in the show notes. Yeah, the color laser printers have gotten relatively inexpensive. You know, they're $200 or less now, I've seen. The toner is what's going to kill you on them. Right. But it, it's worth it, trust me. And when you break it down in most cases, you'll pay less for the toner. You just have to buy more pages, essentially, all at once than with an inkjet. Yep. But oh, laser, if you're looking... Color laser, any laser printer is le- far less expensive than an inkjet. Correct. But the difference is if you're looking for like photo quality pay, uh, printing, lasers are... So much better than they used to be, but they're still not as good as an inkjet with the uh, uh, photo paper. But, you know, you have to get the right printer. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, okay, so that's, that's the maintenance run. You know, and like Chris says, the fall and spring, and, and Daryl, they used to, this fall and spring are good times to go out there and, and check them all. Or, you know, especially if you have 30 to 90 of them. Find them all. Yeah. And good luck finding them all. Yeah. Uh, by the way, geocaching vlogger says, uh, hi, Scott. Good to see you on here. Uh, it's good to see him. Uh, I saw him last night uh, breaking into somebody's house and uh, wandering through their kitchen. So uh, I don't know. A little scary. It's a little scary. Glad well, you don't know where I live. Downhill since I you know. never know what these vloggers are going to do. <laughs> they, you do not. Animals. Uh, but uh, Jim Stark does say that he does have the uh, color uh, printer, the lo- oh, nice. color laser printer. So, okay. yeah. That to me, that is your best option if you want to do logs the right in the rain and yep. the uh, color laser. However, a lot of people will disagree because the right in the rain paper doesn't like some types of pens, uh, yep. and those tend to be their favorite pens. Yep. Uh, Happy Hodag uh, was just going to mention GSAC, yep. that's the one tool he uses to monitor his own caches. It's uh, you know, I've 
I think we're actually getting down here to the ridiculous things that I do to maintain 800 of them. Well, and, why don't we uh, jump into that? Cause we're already at like 45 minutes anyway. That's what I got. Uh, so yeah. So I, I use GSAC extensively to monitor my caches. I have two databases set up specifically. I have one for needs maintenance and the needs maintenance and the DNFs both go into that. And I, um, into that one, I, also have a database. I I run a uh, I run GSAC. I refresh all of my geocaches, you know, every couple of weeks, and then have a filter for show me every cache that has the last DNF is it, every one of mine that has the last DNF, and then that goes in a database. And I do, I don't take any action immediately, uh, but it's on my phone if I'm near that cache, then I'll go ahead and check it and uh, see if it's, you know, there or not there and, uh, and then take actions. Um, this is completely ridiculous. I, in case I miss a email, well, okay, this isn't completely ridiculous. Let me back up one. I do have a uh, rule set up for my email. So the subject line, if the subject line contains needs maintenance, it goes into a separate folder. If it says uh, de reported could not find, it goes into that same folder. That folder pops up unread mail and I catch all of those. Um, but even at that, I go ahead and, uh, and I put a needs maintenance on my own logs. Now, I can't, you can't do a needs maintenance on your own log. So you might uh, have to create a, a sock puppet account uh, for that. Or as Chris knows, uh, I got Bella. I, ha I know Bella's uh, login, and so she does the needs maintenance for me. So you know, I don't, I don't need a sock puppet. What's that, Chris? Dogs have the worst passwords. <laughs> they do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, Chris, I was depending on you to come up with this, but yeah, it's not a sock puppet account; it's a sock puppy account. So, Ooh, <laughs> oh, that's better. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And, and that way it shows up in my pocket query and, and it's, you know, a, a daily or every other day reminder that there are things out there that I need to take up, take up. Um, and then I guess the last uh, tip I'll, I'll do on this is, um, oh, and the, and the last ridiculous thing that I did is volunteered to do this. And since I volunteered to do this, the last two weeks, I've been really good on maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And currently I have one, one cache that needs a lock replaced. And I have three that have issues with the logs and, uh, and in 419, that's all I have. Uh, so I think I'm purer than ivory soap for those old enough to remember what that means. <laughs> 9.4% pure. I believe I am. <laughs> you know, next week we're going to be doing that randomized show. So it's a perfect chance for anyone who has been uh, listening or watching the show after the fact to send in those comments with how you're handling your maintenance. Any questions, uh, that kind of stuff too, send those into geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com. And we'll uh, hopefully get those on the next show. And of course, well, we're going to have plenty more shows, so you can and uh, add those there. Too would like to to make the public service announcement that if you have a geocacher or a cache owner in your area that's not good on maintenance, schedule them to come on our show <laughs> and talk about not maintaining <laughs> caches. And in doing so, they'll you know be guilted into updating all their caches. So there, <laughs> there you go. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, Happy Hodag says that they always do the uh, spring and fall maintenance runs specifically on April 15th and October 15th. Oh, That's really specific. That Not is very the specific. equinox, but close. Yeah. And then uh, Caching Dead New York says, I appreciate when I'm informed of issues with my caches. I want to know if there's something wrong. I want, to, uh, I want my caches to be up to par. I want people to have the full experience I mean them to have. Exactly. Perfect. And meanwhile, uh, geocaching blogger says that he's coming over to my house. Now. <laughs> uh, well, apparently, Daryl, you don't have to be home. Just make sure you've got food in the refrigerator for him to go through. See, that I'm not so sure about, but there are plenty of booby traps, uh, most of them unintentional. <laughs> well, he was on the geo the 
geocaching podcast last night as they were locked into doing the show. Uh, he got through the front door. So I don't know. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> no one's crazier than Joshua. I don't know yeah. about that. <laughs> the good crazy. He, you know, is, a, he thinking, is a good crazy. I'm thinking the host of another uh, podcast is probably equally as crazy, just in different ways. <laughs> it could be. You have to be. Yeah, it, it, to be a, a vlogger or a podcaster, you have to be pretty crazy. You don't have to be crazy, but it helps. It certainly helps. In fact, you don't have to come crazy. We'll train you. <laughs> exactly. And hey, I guess the last yeah. thing that I would say, Daryl, is kind of in wrapping, is use this opportunity to refresh the game board. And a uh, little plug for our for First Find Magazine. Um, what is this? This is uh, Volume 10, Issue 1. Uh, Keith published an article that I wrote about refreshing the game board and I would love to come on your show and talk about it uh, because now that I've been doing it for about four months um, it's a lot more interesting and a lot more uh, intricate than uh, than I thought than I thought it would be and it's and it's very it's 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 excellent I really am enjoying refreshing okay. the game board under certain circumstances mm-hmm well, I definitely want to get you on in uh, January to talk about that because that's going to be the perfect time uh, to talk about, you know, new year, start your uh, new yep. new year, uh, new cash. Yeah. And, new and year, new cash. It, it really dovetails well into a lot of those uh, New Year's Day events like the one that I go to where a lot of people do, you know, every year or two years, whatever, archive those old caches that aren't doing well and replace it with new caches at the first of the year, you know. Perfect. Just a good uh, marker to do it. But, you know, some people, they have an annual mega event of a different type that they'll do that for. So, you know, whatever that date is, it's a good time to uh, free up the uh, space to hide new caches in that area. Yep. Absolutely. So, thanks so much. We'll get that one on the uh, books before too much longer and have you back on with probably within a month. Sounds good. You know, and what was really, really cool? is if you could have somebody who had the opposite side, because there are people who say, hey, all those caches, they're old caches, they should remain and so forth. So there's two sides. And if we could have a discussion with two sides, that'd be excellent. I'll see if I can find somebody who would do that for us. Excellent. Yeah, sounds like a, a great way to go. Uh, and, and kind of to the uh, same effect, we had uh, our Reagan, I think it was, uh, talk about his, uh, uh, I can't remember what the name of the paper is. But whatever, we had him on talking about the uh, heritage caches. I think is mm -hmm. what he called them, uh, and you know when to main when they become heritage caches. So you know that's a good one to go back and listen to as well. Uh, yes. for anyone who's curious about that uh, aspect of it. But you know what makes a, a cache good to uh, save, and when is it uh, worth archiving and freeing up the boards. So at the very least, you can send in your opinions at geogearheads at cashermaniacs.com and we'll uh, uh, take care of some of those on that uh, forthcoming show that we, has not yet been scheduled. Very good. So thanks again uh, for uh, joining us, GSM Times 2, and uh, we will see you within a month. So look, it sounds good. Bella come on the show with us. What's that? Thank you for letting Bella come on the show with us. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> all right and as we mentioned before next week is going to be the randomized show so make sure to send in any of your comments and questions to geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com so that we can have those on that show love it and until then make sure you check the cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com for more on the geogearheads including show notes for this and all of our episodes we love hearing from our listeners so send us feedback by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com or through the many channels of social media. Your support helps keep the Cashamaniac shows coming. Please consider becoming a patron through the link on our website to support the Cashamaniac shows. GeoGearheads is produced by Chris Umfenauer and Daryl Wattenberg. The show's copyright 2019 by Daryl Wattenberg. All rights reserved.